My name is Dr Sarah Alwan and this is how to succeed in your ID blocks. What is an ID block? It's also sometimes referred to as an IAN block or an inferior alveolar nerve block. This is a branch of the mandibular nerve which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve or V3. Highlighted in purple are the areas that are innervated by the mandibular nerve. Any time that we do treatment involving the lower teeth or an area that is supplied by the mandibular nerve, we need to do an ID block to prevent pain. So, how are we going to do this? A closer look at the anatomy shows us the trigeminal ganglion. From this comes the mandibular branch, which forks into two and I've highlighted the inferior alveolar nerve in purple. Notice the offshoots from the inferior alveolar nerve which supply individual teeth. Now let's look at how we give the ID block. Highlighted in purple, I have indicated the area where the LA should be injected. Notice how close this is to the inferior alveolar nerve, which heads inside of the mandible through the mandibular foramen. The key with the procedure is that we want to be close to, but not inside of, the nerve. Contact with the inferior alveolar nerve would be reported by the patient as an electric shock sensation. You should immediately reposition the needle at this stage. Injection into the nerve can cause permanent or transient damage. A successful ID block will numb the teeth to the midline and numb the mandible from the ramus to the inferior border of the body. The soft tissue effects of the ID block have been coloured in purple here. The lower lip, the chin and the labial gingiva are all affected. Having another look at the anatomy, we can see that the Inferior alveolar nerve is very close to the lingual nerve. Often, this nerve is also anaesthetised during the ID block. This will result in numbness to the tongue and the lingual gingivae, as well as the floor of the mouth. Let's get some context. As you can see, this is the ramus of the mandible, the angle of the mandible, and the body of the mandible. Particularly important for the ID nerve is the coronoid notch here, and the internal oblique ridge here. As you can see, my finger will find the coronoid notch and it will slip into the internal oblique ridge. You can practice finding the coronoid notch in your own mouth and then progressing your finger into the internal oblique ridge. Now let's look at where the ID nerve enters into the mandible. This is the mandibular foramen. It is covered over by the lingula. Our aim is to numb in this region as high up as possible because everything proximal to the block will become numb. Because of the complex anatomy, this is a very technique sensitive procedure. Let's look about how we can make a success of it. We start by locating the coronoid notch. Once this has been palpated in the mouth, our finger can then progress into the internal oblique ridge. Our thumb should be parallel with the occlusal plane of the teeth. We can now know that our thumb will be pointing directly at the mandibular foramen. Positioning of the needle is really important at this stage. We position our needle over the premolar region. We then advance our needle until we hit bone. We can note that the needle is now directly above the mandibular foramen, meaning everything below it will become numb. Once we hit bone, we should slightly retract our needle. A soft tissue triangle will be seen in the mouth. From the internal oblique ridge, we will then have a triangle formed with this pterygomandibular raphe. As we have found the correct position, we will administer the cartridge of local anaesthetic. On retraction of the needle, before fully removing from the mouth, if the lingual nerve needs to be anaesthetised, we will then inject a small amount on our removal of the needle. A common cause of failure of ID nerve blocks will be that the needle is too low, falling below the mandibular foramen. Let's demonstrate how to do this clinically. In this case, my thumb feels out for the coronoid notch. My thumb then advances slightly into the internal oblique ridge. Notice how I'm holding the cheek back for good vision of the procedure. We can see that the pterygomandibular raphe is under increased tension and becomes more prominent and easy to see.
The pterygomandibular raphe and the internal oblique ridge can be thought of as an upside down triangle and we want to inject in the middle of it. You will notice a depression. Spot how clear this becomes when I press on the middle of the triangle with the cap on. Now we will demonstrate giving the ID block. Again, my thumb finds the coronoid notch and advances slightly to the internal oblique ridge. Note the positioning of my needle is over the premolar region. I then inject into the middle of the upside down triangle formed by the internal oblique ridge and the pterygomandibular raphe. My needle advances 2.5 cm until it hits bone. I then retract slightly, aspirate my needle to assess there is no blood in the local anaesthetic. That allows me to be sure that we are not in a blood vessel. I slowly administer the cartridge and continue to do so on retraction so I can catch the lingual nerve. So, in summary, we need to do ID block injections to carry out treatment painlessly. There are two key elements of anatomy to understand. Firstly, the distribution of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, specifically where this enters into the mandible. Secondly, we must identify where to inject by feeling for the coronoid notch, retracting for good visibility and ensuring good lighting. Palpating the internal oblique ridge and placing this under some tension so that the pterygomandibular raphe can be seen clearly. These injections are very sensitive to good technique. If you find yours are failing after a revision of the anatomy, you should aim to inject higher up, more superiorly to block the nerve closer to the ganglion. When placing the needle, in, if bone is hit too soon, you've probably struck the superior ramus of the mandible or the coronoid process. You should swing the needle position from the premolar teeth to the anterior teeth until bone is contacted again with the needle fully advanced at around 2.5 centimetres. If bone is not contacted at all, there is a possibility that you've entered into the parotid gland. This poses an issue as the cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, runs through this. Anesthesia here will result in temporary paralysis of the muscles of facial expression of the affected size. The eyelids may not close in this scenario. In these circumstances, it's important to reassure the patient that this is temporary and an eye patch or a covering with gauze is advised until the anaesthetic wears off. Therefore, it is important to retract the needle in this case and swing it towards the posterior molar teeth until bone is then contacted. Post-operative advice must always be given. Emphasise to the patient that they should avoid hot food and drinks until the numbness has fully worn off. Avoid biting any soft tissue which will cause pain and swelling once the sensation returns to the lips, cheeks and tongue. Duration will depend on what anaesthetic you have chosen to use and you should inform the patient that the site of injection may be sore for several days post-procedure. Thank you for listening. Please email any questions and good luck for your IDBs.